All right, hello everyone. So today marks actually a pretty important transition in the course um, because we have been spending a lot of time up until now talking about perception and primary sensory systems in the human brain, vision, sight, touch, taste, smell, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason we've dedicated so much time to that is because honestly, that is just overwhelmingly what we know the most about in the brain. Um, later in the course, we're going to talk about things like emotions in the brain, social perception in the brain, development in the brain, which are super fascinating and interesting topics, and I wish we could talk more about them. Um, unfortunately, they're very, very young fields, and so we just don't know nearly as much. And so into getting an understanding of cognitive neuroscience is to get an understanding of sensory systems, because that's where all the methods and the ideas and the theories have been largely developed that then people are able to apply into new domains of cognition. Um, so today, the domain of cognition that we're going to branch out from, as opposed to focusing primarily on, you know, primary motor or sensory systems, sensory motor systems too as well, uh, are with the domain of navigation and memory. And we're uh, going to start here with navigation. Now, navigation and memory, why I'm linking them together, it might not seem super apparent at first, but hopefully by the end of this lecture, you can kind of understand how these two systems are actually relatively related to one another, specifically because um, there's a structure in the brain called the hippocampus that we've talked a little bit about, which is obviously super crucial for memory, but it also plays, as you'll see in a little while, an, an incredibly important um, role in navigation. So I actually wanted to start off in kind of an interesting way because the first little bit, this, this section one will be probably the shortest of these units, is actually just gonna be telling you some amazing navigational feats from the animal kingdom. Um, and there's not as much about the brain with these, and it clearly doesn't have anything to do with humans, but they are so amazing when you think about it that I just couldn't resist sharing it with you all because I find them just so incredible. So this is a monarch butterfly. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Monarch, monarch, butter, ugh, why am I struggling to say that? A monarch butterfly weighs about half of a gram. It's very, very itty bitty. And monarch butterflies in North America undergo one of the more impressive feats of navigation throughout the year. So basically what ends up happening is that monarch butterflies are distributed across the northern United States and up into Canada even. And then during the winter period, they migrate to this one particular spot in Mexico. And that is where they spend their uh, winter time period because it's too cold up here for them. So they go south and then um, that's what's going on in orange is their summer migration for the winter and then once they come out of winter you see the green which is the spring migration okay so it's, it's nice back and forth and when you go down to mexico during this period in the winter range there are literally just millions of these monarch butterflies to the point where they are just totally covering these trees those aren't leaves those are all butterflies um, and actually they huddle together like that to stay warm um, because even though they're in mexico and even though it's a more uh, warmer climate than it is in other parts of north america they still need to huddle together because they're very small. They can freeze it up very easily. In fact, there was a period not that long ago, I can't remember when, where a frost went through this period of Mexico and actually many of them froze to death. And you could just literally walk by and just start plucking, plucking them off the trees um, because so many of them froze to death. Okay, so why am I telling you about monarch butterflies? It's not that amazing that an animal migrates south in the winter. Lots of animals do that. Birds and spe specifically do that, okay? So why am I telling you about how cool it is that monarch butterflies do this? Okay, so first of all, it's cool that they all seem to migrate to one spot, sure, but here's what makes it amazing, okay? This is the key part. No individual monarch butterfly completes this whole trip, okay? One single butterfly does not actually go from Iowa to Texas to Mexico, back up to Texas to Iowa. It's not as if, like it is with a goose, a goose, geese, goose, geese, duck, whatever, a bird, a bird will go through this cycle multiple times throughout its life, okay? A monarch butterfly doesn't because the lifespan of a monarch butterfly is so short that one monarch butterfly might be able to make it from say Iowa to Texas during the summer or as like, you know, it turns into fall. And then its offspring will make it from uh, Texas to this part of Mexico. And then its offspring will get back to Texas and then its offspring will get back to Iowa. So it's this intergenerational thing. So it's basically uh, like somehow in their genetic code is embedded this idea of like, this is the navigational route that they need to go for their migration pattern. Even though all these butterflies that are making it to Mexico, none of them have ever been there before. 
None of their parents have even been there before. None of their grandparents have even been there before. It's like their great, great, great grandparents. But somehow across these generations, there's something in their little monarch butterfly brains that guides them all to that exact spot in uh, Mexico, even though a couple generations later, they all spread out all over, you know, the continental United States and Canada. A couple generations later, they all get there again. How do they do that? They don't have language. They don't have maps. They don't have Google Earth. They don't have any of these things available to them. But there's something in their genetic code that not only tells them where to go, but it does it across multiple generations. Um, how that is, total mystery to me, fa fa fabulous. Um, another animal I want to talk about, we're going to talk about, what is it, two, three different animals? Yeah, two animals, three animals, three animals, so two more, is the female loggerhead turtle. So this is the female loggerhead turtle. They're a pretty big turtle. They get, you know, quite large. Um, and so what happens is that the female loggerhead turtle is kind of a, has a different problem than the monarch butterfly because while a monarch butterfly lives for a couple months, the loggerhead turtle lives for many, 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 many decades. They have a very long lifespan, actually. And so it turns out that after several decades and actually after traversing potentially thousands of miles in the world, these loggerhead turtles will want to go back to their natal beach to lay eggs. A natal beach is just the same beach that, they're, that they hatched from. So basically what they wanna do is they wanna go lay eggs in the same beach where they were initially laid as eggs themselves, okay? Now, this is interesting in of its own right because how does a turtle, I mean, seriously, think about it, guys. How does a turtle travel thousands of miles all over the ocean and then make its way back to one island? That in itself is hard enough. I have the worst sense of direction of like, probably anyone who's listening to these lectures right now. It is unbelievable. Um, this is a weird story to tell you. I can tell you really quickly. I am from Texas. One time I was visiting my friend who lives in Austin. Austin is in the middle of Texas. I am from Houston. Houston is in the southeast corner of Texas. There is a highway that runs across Texas. I got on that highway in Austin. I should have gone east. Instead, I went west for like three hours before I realized I was driving in the wrong direction. Um, I was, what was I, 19. I had to call my mom at two in the morning to tell her what I had done. She cried. It's okay. I made it. Anyways, so it's hard enough to imagine how a loggerhead turtle does this. But scientists were starting to get a sense of it. Started, scientists were studying them, trying to get a sense of how they do it, observing their behavior. But then something interesting and really crazy was happening with these female loggerhead turtles. What the scientists noticed is that sometimes these turtles would go to the wrong point of the ocean and then basically act like they were lost and confused. Like they would get to a part in the ocean, a couple miles off of the, of the beach where they should be going. And then they would just kind of like, they kind of get panicked. It was almost like they were seeing lost. It was almost like they'd like dropped their keys or something. And they were just kind of swimming in circles. Okay. And for a while, the scientists couldn't really figure out what was going on with the female loggerhead turtles and why they were doing this. But then they had an epiphany and they figured out what was going on. So what was going on is the fact that these turtles can live so long sometimes. I don't know exactly where loggerhead turtles are, but you can see box turtles and giant tortoises are you know, longer lifespan than humans. That actually, what's going on is that sometimes they'll try to return to their natal beach so many decades later that it turns out that the reason that they can't find it is that it's not that they're lost, it's that the magnetic fields of the earth have shifted and it's the magnetic fields of the earth that they're using to know where to go. Because at any given moment, there is a natural magnetic field around the earth and it's these sort of fields that the turtles are able to kind of sense somehow and pick up on and they try to return to that same moment in space for in relative to these magnetic uh, fields to get to their, uh, their natal beach. But sometimes because their lifespan is so long, the magnetic fields have actually shifted. So in their mind, they're like, wait, what's going on? I am in the right spot. I'm supposed to be in this little you know, nook or cranny, whatever, in terms of this magnetic structure, but uh, I'm here, I'm in the right spot, but there should be land here. Why is there no land here? What's going on? Um, and so they'll just kind of circle in that same position because they unfortunately were part of this generation of turtles who lived long enough that the, the magnetic field actually shifted. How they do that, how that's implemented in the brain, honestly, people don't really know. All right, the last species I want to tell you about, um, and I think this is my favorite one. I think this is actually one of my favorite anecdotes, stories, results, findings in all of science. Um, so please pay close attention, just humor me, because I think this is just fantastic. Um, these are Saharan desert, desert ants, and Saharan desert ants are pretty interesting. They live in the Sahara. 
And what they will do is they will do something that's called dead reckoning. So they'll have a little home. It can be like a nest or a burrow. And what they will do is they'll come out in the morning and they will be running around scouring for food. And so they go on this crazy pathway looking for food, looking for food, do, 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 do. Oh, now they found some food, okay? Now the moment they have found some food, they will make a beeline straight back to where they are go, back to where they meant to go, back to their home, okay? So even though they took this sort of circuitous route, they will then dead reckon right back to where they wanted to go, okay? Now, at first, you might think like, okay, so they're looking at their landmarks, they're maybe looking at the clouds, they're doing something like that, they understand like the rel relative geometry where they are, and that's how they dead reckon, right? Uh, no, they do something much more complicated. So here's how you can know that they're doing something co more complicated. So they've done these experiments where you have the nest, the animal, the ant comes out of the nest, runs around in its random crazy path, dooby 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 doo, boom, it gets here, okay? And as soon as the ant, the ant finds the food, okay, this is gonna sound odd, you spritz the ant to anesthetize it. You put it to sleep for a couple seconds, okay? And while it is asleep, you move it a couple meeting, meet, uh, meters to the left or to the right or whatever, okay? So you put the ant, the ant back here, this release point, it's now got the food, and it wants to make a dead reckon back home, okay? What does the ant do? What you would expect the ant to do is to make a dead reckon in a different direction. It would just go this way now because it could maybe look around, get a sense of its bearing and be like, oh, I used to be over here and now I'm over here, so I'm gonna move that way, right? Wrong. What the ant does is this. The ant will make a uh, dead reckon in the same direction as it before, get around to the point where its nest is supposed to be and then like the female loggerhead turtle, get kind of confused, get kind of lost. Because it'll be like, what's going on? This is where my home is supposed to be. Now, for a while, scientists were confused. Why is this happening? Why is the ant not figuring out how to get back to its home, okay? Well, it must not be that it's tracking the sun. It must not be that it's tracking magnetics. It must not be laying a chemical trail or anything like that. So how are the ants doing it? How are the ants able to dead reckon in the first place if they're not just using these different types of cues, okay? it turns out that what they are doing is they're forming a mental map of where they are by counting their steps, okay? They're basically doing pretty sophisticated geometry by figuring out like, I've gone this many feet to the left, I've gone this many feet to the top right, now to the left. They're understanding the relative geometry of how far they've gone, such that even with their eyes closed, even in the dark, they would still have such a, of a precise mental map that they can dead reckon back home, okay? Because what they're doing is literally figuring out how many steps have I taken, how much distance have I traversed, and so therefore, if I've gone you know, this far in this distance, I know that this is as far as I need to go, such that when you move the ant over here, it will uh, make this mistake in this direction that we saw before. So how do you prove something like this? How do you prove that this is what the ants are doing? This is the cool part. I would never have thought to make, do this experiment. So what these scientists decided to do is to create three special times of ants, okay? There are the normal ants, where their legs are perfectly normal length. There are the stilt ants, where they literally put stilts on these little ants so that their legs are longer. And then there are stump ants, where they cut off parts of the legs of the ants. Um, to give you a sense of what this looks like for real, these are the normal legged ants, these are the stilt ants, these are the stumped ants, okay? So stilt ants, every time they take a couple steps, are gonna go further than the normal legs um, ants. And stump ants with small, tiny legs are gonna are gonna go a few like distance shorter. I don't, you know, their their steps. You know, if a normal uh, ant goes ten feet in ten steps, this one will go five feet in ten steps, whereas this one will go twenty feet in in ten steps or whatever. Sorry if I messed that up. I think you get the idea. So the question is basically, um, what will be different between the stilt, the stump, and the normal ant in terms of how they behave, okay? Because remember, normal ants, this is how far their steps are, this is how much distance they traverse, whereas the stump ants, they don't go quite as far. You can see that the distance is uh, a little bit shorter. So it turns out that what you can do is you can take these ants and you can let them go out and search for the food naturally. They just wander around, wander around, boom, they find the food that they want, okay? And then once again, when they find it, you spray them with a little anesthesia, and that's when you change their legs, okay? So you let them come out of the, of the what you call it, the hive or the little burrow as normal. But then once they find the food, you can anesthetize them, and you can turn them into a stump ant or into a stilt ant, okay? So now you've got these ants. 
that found the food like normal. And then they, while they were anesthetized, they became stump ant or stilt ants, okay? You then release them and see what they do and how they behave, okay? So this is exactly what happens. Um, this is the point of release at zero, and the ants in this particular experiment were 10 meters away from their little home, okay? The normal ants, they basically hit the nail on the head. They're released here, they run 10 meters, they're happy. The stilt ants, who now are going longer distances because they have these long legs, they will actually sh overshoot their home, and then they will get stuck about 15 meters away being like, where is it? The home is supposed to be here. The stump ants will undershoot it. They'll walk the same number of steps, but they're doing tiny little steps, and then they'll get short of their homeward, uh, or their home, of their home burrow, and then they'll be like, what's, what's going on? Um, it's supposed to be right here, okay? So here's another follow-up question, which is great. What will the ants do if they go out of the nest already with the stumps and the stilts? Because remember, in this particular experiment, they run out normal, but then when they run back, that's after you've made them have little stilts or little stumps. If you let them run in and out, okay, so that the number of the distance that they're following is always constant, in that case, they totally get it, okay? Because in this situation, they're counting their steps, they know how far they're going, and nothing is changing halfway through. It's only when things are changing halfway through that they get really screwed up. Um, so really, these tiny little guys, these tiny little dudes, these Saharan desert ants, which are like, they're really bitty. They can like fit on, a couple of them could fit on your fingernail, have enough going on in their brain, in spite of the fact that they're such simplistic little creatures, that they're doing super advanced like geometry. Um, years ago, when I was a, a grad student at Harvard, and I was teaching stuff about this, we had enough time during a discussion section that I got a couple volunteers to try to do this, okay? We turned off like all the lights, we blindfolded them, and we basically were like, all right, run around, forage for something, and they actually felt around and found it. And then they found it, and I was like, all right, now go back to the starting point, and they were hopelessly lost. It's impossible. It's really, really difficult. These ants, they just do it naturally without any training or any effect whatsoever. So navigation is a, just, to me, a very interesting and curiously fascinating type of topic. And so what we're going to do now um, for the rest of this section, at least on navigation, is we're going to focus on navigation with a particular focus, not on creatures like turtles, ants, and monarch butterflies, cool though they may be, um, but we're going to focus on navigation in the human brain. Um, and when you come back for section two, that is what we're going to talk about will be navigation in the human brain. So I'll see you soon.